What's up, IG? Let me see if anybody's gonna come in on a Thursday night. What's up, what's up? Good evening, good evening. How are y'all doing tonight? Hey, Lauren, hey, Lauren. How are you doing, how are you doing? I'm coming on for a few minutes. Hey, Michelle, Dr. Cecilia, how are y'all doing tonight? I'm coming on. Hey, Nicole, I'm coming on. Hey, right, Reverend Anthony. Is that my classmate, Randy Teichler? How are you doing, Randy? Good evening, God's child. Good evening, Monique Cherise. I am coming on for a few minutes. Y'all know I always say that, but I really am. Good evening, Miss Kena Lene. Um, good to see you, Randy. Thanks for hopping on. Uh, hey, Trin. Good evening, Murphy. Good evening, good evening. How are y'all doing? How are y'all doing? Is that, uh, is that Miss Cecilia? Is that Cece? Yeah, Anthony, we need love today. We need love today. Hey, Preston, I'm hopping on tonight. Good evening. I am, Randy, coming in and out. Um, I do plan to attend the football game tomorrow night, and then I have an event on Saturday morning. And then, hey, Cheyenne, I don't know about the remainder, but I do plan to be there tomorrow night. So I hope to see you. Oh, uh, that is Elder CC. Uh, yeah, hey Vanessa. I am hopping on just a little bit tonight. Uh, good to see you, Shaye. You know, listen, it's been some kind of day today and that's why you see me in these pink uh, glasses that are very old because they're dollar store glasses. Because I believe I left my glasses at Nordstrom Rack. One pair of my glasses. The other pair, I um, I, I need to take them because I bent them up. So it's just been some kind of day. Hey, uh, Randy, praise the Lord that you have reversed uh, type 2 diabetes. That's a blessing. So no, Trend, these are not new glasses. That's why you see reflections. Because, um, because they're some old glasses that I had a long time ago that I had to go find. I had several, I have like three pairs. I used to have dollar store glasses all the time. I would buy like them in, in bulk and I would just have them everywhere. Oh wow, Randy, you had 22 weeks becoming vegan. I commend you on that because I am a carnivore at my heart, praise the Lord. Um, but I commend you on the discipline that it takes to Take care of your health and take care of your body. Come on in. Come on in. I see Darian. I see Walkaway, Renee. I see D. I see um, She Plans, God's, God Leads. Yes, praying for our beloved pastor. Was that the doorbell that I just heard? But anyway, I don't know. If it was, I'll hear it again. Um, hopping on tonight, for those of you who attend church with me, it has been a somber type of day um, because one of our pastors transitioned last night. And particularly those of us who are ministers, our elders. Hold on one second. This is I.
sorry y'all. I thought John was coming right here. <laughs> I'm sorry y'all. That was my child. Sorry y'all. Hey Eric, who all jumped on? Um, praise the Lord. Randy, I see that you're a survivor of paralysis. Yeah, that was scary. It was one son, but I couldn't see the car outside. So for those who don't know, then I go get the man to come answer the door. So I went and got my husband. So sorry about that little break. But anyway, um, yeah, it's been a somber day for those of us who attend our church, um, particularly those of us who are ministers and elders and who went through um, ministry school there at our church because Pastor Bonemu was the overseer of several ministries, but one in particular was our ministers and elders. And she afforded me the opportunity to teach as well as Elder Cece, who was on here. Exactly, Taylor. Did you hear that knock? It was Joshua. <laughs> um, hey, Ben. Um, yeah, she was over the women's ministry. And she was just an amazing, amazing, amazing person. And I know we often say that about people when they transition. But, you know, we've been saying this now for a couple of years that the generals of our faith are leaving. And sometimes when we say general of the faith, we think it's somebody that the whole world knows. But no, it's actually someone who was a good steward of that which God had given them. She was a teacher par excellence, uh, it, particularly if you caught her in the middle of her prime. Um, she was just a teacher's teacher. Yes, there's a changing of the guards. She was the teacher's teachers of teachers. For those of you who know your Bible, um, she taught the tabernacle like nobody else on this planet. It's like the tabernacle, like God gave her her a, a unique revelation and way. Um, yes, Queen Angela. And she would always say, I said, I feel guilty for being sad because I heard her say too many times that, um, she was ready for God to come back. She was like, we're too, we're too, we're too, um, stuck on this world. We're too attached to the things of this world. This is not our home. Jesus could split the sky now. She would say that so many times. And so, um, yeah, you said that's why I can draw it now. Like, I really want to say if you weren't taught the tabernacle about by, by, by Pastor Moon, you were never taught the tabernacle. I, I would just really put it out there to say it because she was a skilled wordsmith, not just with vocabulary, but she knew how to yield uh, will, uh, yield the, the sword of the spirit appropriately. And one of the things about her, she was a purveyor of truth, conveyor of truth. She, she just embodied truth, the truth of the word of God. And so I, I'm grateful that in fall 2012, I began to teach in the school of ministry, which was unique at that time because I had just become an elder in that June and she afforded me the opportunity to start teaching uh, immediately. And it is through teaching the school of ministry that the Lord began to open up my gift of teaching. I knew I was called to be a preacher. So many of you will say, oh, Pastor uh, Elder Dobbins. Oh, Lord, I call myself, almost call myself pastor. No, no, no. Elder Dobbins, um, you really have a great way of breaking that down. It was through teaching consistently that I developed that gift. There was one season that I taught every week. It was back when Fison was on Mondays and not Tuesdays. I taught every week of every semester. And when you have to teach, you have to study and it pulls something else out of you. And so I definitely know that my ministry has been shaped. Yeah. All right, pastor has been shaped by many women, my mother, my aunts, but she is one of the women that has shaped me too because she gave me a place to cultivate and develop my gift. Listen, if you haven't heard me say anything else, we all need a place. I, I, I get it, Elder Cece. She said, I heard the Holy Ghost. Amen, amen. Um, we all need a place to cultivate and develop our giftings. And she allowed me that opportunity. She trusted the God in me. And it was interesting. She would always say, 
And we're not going to talk about this forever. We're, this is just where I'm starting because I see so many of my church family on here. And I don't want to skip past um, what's going on in the natural for all of us. Yes, she was definitely a poor prayer warrior, Miss Keena Lene. Yes, and she was an amazing. Uh, Vanessa says she remembers when I talked seven, Second Timothy. Well, first of all, when I taught Second Timothy, it was the first time I taught in class. And so... I came in swinging, much like what Eric calls me, Machine Gun Christie. I came in like swinging uh, completely. And so, but I thank her for the opportunity to stand before God's people and to stand alongside her as a teacher. And I thank her, you know, it, this was so shocking to us because I taught the book of John last week and I taught the... Um, the first part of the book of John, John, St. John chapters 1 through 10 last Tuesday, and I taught St. John's, the second part portion last Saturday. And last week on a Tuesday, we all as instructors would meet with her before class, 30 minutes on Zoom, and she was on Zoom saying, good evening, Elder Dobbins, what are you, be, what has the Lord given you tonight for the people? And I gave her a summary of how I was going to approach the text, and so uh, I don't want to skip past that because so many people are on here from my church and I saw Brother Anthony put the heart and I know that that meant our hearts are all uh, a little sad today. But I'm telling you, now this could sound deep and, and spooky to somebody, but I'm telling you because Pastor Moon had such a mastery of teaching uh, not only the... the um, the Tabernacle. The book of Ezekiel was one of her favorite books. So I was very honored when she began to allow me to teach that book. Uh, the book of Hebrews was one of her favorite books. And at a season, she began to allow Pastor Cora to teach that book. And so she knew that that was an honor. I believe she posted about that tonight. Um, and so, so many, um, so many nuggets that we received from her and that we we gained from being part of her 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 team that taught and so i i've been able to teach oh yeah when she taught dispensations that was another one and the covenants and so you know it's funny because many people go to church for years and all of their life and they've never heard of the, heard the dispensations all taught or the covenants all taught and so all of these things uh, were really, really um, second nature to her. She, she had the, she had, she loved the word. She was, like I said, she loved the truth. She was not one to water down the truth. And so we all just will, will miss her, but we all know that she is rejoicing because if she said it once, she said it twice. She was ready for God to come back. And I don't mean she said it recently. I mean, it's been years ago she would say, you know, y'all are all too attached to this, this world. This is not our home. And that I, I'm just waiting for Jesus to, to crack the sky and come and get me any day. And so he came and got her. And I said that all to say with her knowledge of the tabernacle and the Old Testament and the way she did it, you know, to me, not to be super spiritual, it was only appropriate that she transitioned on on the Day of Atonement, on the day that symbolizes that our Savior shed and made the final atonement for our sins, that we might be back at one with God. And she could teach that like no other. And so I am honored to have known her, honored to have served and honored that she would allow me to teach alongside her. And to just to follow in her footsteps as a woman uh, of the gospel. And sometimes as women, we need to see other women. Yes, Lauren. Uh, yeah, um, we need to see other women uh, and see how they navigate what it looks like to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So often, if you're not part of the church world, you may think that there are disparities, you know, in the workplace. Yes, she did. She always said that, Elder CC. She did. Uh, you may think that there are disparity, disparities between men and women in the workplace, and there are. You may think it's uh, in many places throughout society, but there is still disparities in the kingdom of God with women and men. And so I was grateful to sit alongside her and to watch her because sometimes that's the best form of mentorship. When men can watch you. That's why it's mentorship. My pastor says it this way. Mentorship is men touring your life. I'm going to say it again. Mentorship is men 
touring your life. And so we were able to see her tour, see her, her life, how she was a woman of business. She had a very successful landscaping business, which was another uh, thing she did that was a male dominated field. And we saw her transition and go into full time ministry. And she had a thriving, successful business. Uh, not just the startup or a pop up, but, but she had had a long longevity. Um, and so even though our hearts are sad, our hearts are glad because one thing we know, if anybody was going to go on in, it was going to be her. And so I took that time to honor her because I see so many people from my church on here and I don't want to act like, um, act like that didn't happen and that all of us haven't been impacted and all of us haven't been affected. Uh, the Bible says mourn with them that mourn. And I think it's a time when we all are sharing in the same loss to find a level of connectivity to mourn with them that mourn. You know, I believe it's Matthew 5 and 4 that says, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Hey, Israel, uh, and and I, I just talked about this last week in New Jersey, and we're going to move on um, from this and move to just wherever the spirit leaves us for a few minutes. But I just talked about this a few week, uh, last week when I went to New Jersey, and I hope this helps somebody, whether you're in a, in a, trend, a season of grief now, whether you've had something that you've not resolved, or whether grief is on the way, I, whichever way it is. I want to tell you the way the Holy Spirit began to give it to me is when we talk about grief, when the Bible says, blessed are they who mourn for they shall be comforted. Um, the way I began to look it up, hey, Nyla, uh, I began to study it a little bit and, and just to pray a little bit. And when I researched and I found that grief is the definition of all the thoughts you have toward that loved one, how you feel about the loved one passing. Grief is the thoughts, the, the, the feelings, the memories, everything that is on the outside. Mourning is what's on the inside being expressed on the outside. Oftentimes we don't receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit because what we receive, what we have on the inside, we stuff it. Uh, we don't talk about it. We don't express it. We keep it inside and we stuff ourselves. Yet when we open up our mouth and allow the feelings, the thoughts, the memories and how we feel to come externally, it puts us in a position of mourning. So we go from just being in a position of grief to mourning. So grief. Grief is internal, mourning is external, and when you mourn, you put yourself in position to receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And this is not just about death. Where you could mourn the loss of a business, the loss of a job, the loss of a relationship, the loss of a friendship. It could be a marriage. It could be a friendship, anything. It could also be the loss of a season. I was talking to someone today who is going through a transition. Hey, Alexandra is going through a transition because they are now an empty nester. And, you know, you grow up with your children and all you say is, oh, you want them to grow up. You want them to grow up. But but actually, once they grow up. Now you have to transition to a new season. And in order to successfully do that, you have to mourn the season of what was. You have to release the feelings, the thoughts, the emotions, how you feel about it, how you think about it. You release it out so that you mourn it rather than stuffing it in and keeping it inside and bottling it up. And, and, and leaving it so contained that it leaves you vulnerable to an explosion. You know, if you leave something contained and you shake it up for too long, it will ultimately it that we move just from just saying that we are in grief and move to mourning so that we can receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit because blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. And so I started off talking about that because a lot of us, for those just get, uh, tuning in, one of the pastors at our church passed away last night. And so a lot of my church members, not my, I'm sorry, our church members are on tonight. Um, and so I just wanted to express and acknowledge what we're all thinking and what we're all feeling. And um, other than that, this is getting ready to be a powerful 
weekend as we transition or segue into this weekend you know i am believing and i'm expecting an outpouring of the holy spirit this weekend we have closing the gap thank you darian thank you so much we have closing the gap on saturday and one thing that i have learned to do over the course of my life is to even turn those painful moments into power uh, it, turning pain into power. Bishop preached that sermon a long time ago, turning pain into power. And so I am expecting to press in and to lean in to the Holy Spirit this weekend. And whomever joins us, whether you join us in the building, whether you join us online, I am expecting the unexpected. What do you mean by that, Elder Dobbins? See, I know there are some things that you've been believing God for, and I know there's some things that you have been praying for, and I know there are some things that you have been standing in the gap for others for, and so there are some specific things that you are expecting, but I believe that when we fall into Ephesians 3.20, when it says, now unto him who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think, that pushes us into the unexpected. So yes, there is something that we're expecting on Saturday and we want that to be answered but I am believing God for the unexpected to happen. I am believing God for a supernatural tsunami to fill that place and fall upon everyone in that room or on the air or watching through the airwaves and you're going to receive the unexpected expected. Hey, smarty pants. Some of you, the reason it's going to be the unexpected is because actually the things that you have been expecting are actually too low. You have set the bar actually too low, but you have been faithful in praying. You have been diligent in seeking him. You have been diligent in, in studying his word and coming before him. And I don't mean from a legalistic standpoint. I mean that your heart is postured toward him. See, oftentimes, we think when we say certain things that this means that a person is praying all day or reading their Bible all day, but really it is your heart is in a posture that at any given moment, God can speak to you and you steal away and stealing away doesn't mean you even have to leave the room with other people, but you steal away in your heart. You are communing and you are fellowshipping with him. You steal away and you go to the bathroom or you steal away and go to a break room if you're at work because your heart is in position to hear from him all day, all day long, all day long, that you are in a position and a posture to hear from God, that even uh, when you are doing your other duties and you're uh, fulfilling your obligations and completing tasks, that your heart is in a position to always hear when the father speaks. Jesus said it this way. He says, I don't speak unless the father speaks. He then begins to tell the disciples about the Holy Spirit and says, when he comes, he will not speak unless he hears the father speak. So it is critical that you and I posture ourselves to hear from God consistently throughout the day. You know, I was talking to someone and this is just actually an organic flow tonight and whatever the Holy Spirit speaks, he speaks tonight and we are listening to him tonight. We have our ear tuned in to hear because we have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When the Bible says hear it, an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, it is saying I-N-G. The Spirit is always speaking, but his people are not always listening. Listening. I'm going to say that again. The spirit is always speaking, but his people are not always listening. We need to lean into the power and the presence. As Lauren just says, being constantly aware of his presence, being constantly aware that God is here, that God is in me, that God is with me, that God is here. And therefore, I am in tune to hear what the spirit is saying to the church. He's always speaking. The children of God are just not always listening. That's why in this season, you have to be uh, aware of, and I think I saw First Lady or Pastor Sharmicia come on earlier. Hey, Misi. Um, we have to be aware of the distractions that the enemy sends to prevent us from hearing from God. We have to be aware of, of the things that the enemy uses to draw us away. Let me, let me read a scripture to you. Let me, let me get it. I don't, uh, 
let me see. You know, I um I always have it for those that I don't know where the scripture is found so I can pull it up. Let me read it to you this way. Uh, I'm going to go to the book of James right quick, quick. And I want to read this to you in a different, I'm going to read it into, to you in two translations. I'm going to read it first in the King James. The book of James chapter one, verse 14 says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So every man is tempted. Let's settle that right now. We will all be tempted. The enemy is going to try to tempt each one of us. Every man is tempted being drawn away and being enticed. No, no, no. When he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's the King James Version. I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and draw, drag us away. I'm going to read that again. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. I'm going to read it in the NIV. But each person, somebody say each in the comments. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own, somebody say own, O-W-N. That means possession. That means it is yours. That means Elder Dobbins' own. It means your own evil desire and enticed. So I'm going to back up to verse 13, James 1 and 13. When tempted, no one should say, nobody should say this. God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when his own evil desires and is lured away and enticed. I just, hold on, y'all getting ready. I didn't plan to teach, teach tonight. Let me, let me just pull up because I'm going to have to read more than, let me just pull up the whole chapter. And I'm going to read it. Uh, I'm going to start it again. I'm going to start at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endured temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So let's start here. You will be tempted, but God does not tempt us with evil. So anytime you are tempted with evil, the first thing to understand is the devil tempted you. We're talking about distractions that keep us from hearing God. I'm not lost. Anytime you are tempted, it is the devil or Satan that has tempted you because God can't tempt you with evil. He does not tempt you with evil. God does not tempt you with, let's just do something really simple. He does not tempt you with another man's wife. He does not tempt you with another woman's husband. He does not tempt you with evil. He does test us, but he does not use evil to test us. God does not, God, listen, God does not tempt so let, let's stop between testing and tempting. Testing is to build you up. Tempting is to draw you away from God. Let's break that difference down right there. Testing is to build you up in your faith, to, to work out your faith muscles, work out joy, to work out peace, to work out long suffering in you. You may be tested, but you temptation is to draw you away from God. T testing is to mature you in God. 
When you are tested, think of it in the natural. You take a test, you pass the, the, the test, you end up passing the grade, and you are promoted to the next grade. Temptation was sent from the devil or is sent to draw you away. So he says, let no man when he is tempted say, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any of any man. So because God cannot be tempted with evil, he is not going to tempt you with evil. But every man is tempted, so we're all going to be tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. We need to understand there that word lust can be substituted to say your desires. We all have desires that are not godly desires, that are sinful desires, because the Bible tells us, David said it this way, we were all born in sin and shapen in iniquity. That, that shapen is an, in iniquity means there is an iniquity. There is an inner something that has been formed in you, your circumstances, what happened to you, your family DNA, all of those things help shape you to a particular iniquity. We all are born in sin, meaning we all have a sinful nature when we are born. Nobody when they are born has a righteous nature. That is why we needed atonement, that day of atonement that just passed. And yes, the day of atonement that just passed was something that they honored in days of old. And it had to be done every year. But Jesus became the ultimate and final sacrifice and sacrificial lamb of atonement. When we all were born, we were all born with sinful nature, but we were all shaped to have particular proclivities. We all were shaped, shaping an iniquity to have particular desires. What happened to us? What were we exposed to? You don't even realize that you can be exposed to things even when they're in your mother's womb. And you may be, feel like, thank you, Holy Ghost, this may make you feel like you're born a particular way, whatever way it is. I'm not picking out any way other than the other. Uh, over the other, you may feel like you're born a particular way because you were exposed even in the womb. Yes, born with a particular bent, born with a particular proclivity. All of that is shaping in you, though. To, to, to have a void from rejection and be vulnerable to people because of rejection meant that you were shaped in rejection, meant you had encountered rejection somewhere that it helped form you. And now your lust, that's a, this is a safe one, your lust or desire can be acceptance. And you are willing to pay any price, whether it is in accordance with God's word or not, because the need to be accepted is the result of the rejection that shaped you. I didn't think we were going like this deep tonight. This was a jump on for 5, 15, 20 minutes. So I'm going to say it again. Let no man when he is tempted... Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. So God cannot himself be tempted with evil. Therefore, he does not tempt you with evil. For those of you that are just coming on, we have already talked about the fact that God tests you. And when you are tested, it, it facilitates growth in your life. But when you are tempted, it is intended to pull you away from God. So the devil sends evil temptations to pull you away from God, which is all he does is observes you all of your life. He observes your, your, your appetite, not just for food, not just for food. He observes your appetite. Uh, what, 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 what fills the void for you? He observes the atmosphere you were born into. If everybody in your family is an alcoholic, he, he observed all of the things, all of these things that have helped shape you. For when the Bible says you were born in sin and shaping in iniquity, the devil has watched all of these things about you to strategically try to cause you to fall based on your own vulnerabilities. He's looking for where you're weak. He's looking for your patterns. 
He's not looking to create a new distraction. He's watched you. He studied you to see how you have been shaping and what your iniquity is in. And therefore, that's why the Bible says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust or other word, own desire and enticed. Now, I want you to get this. The lust, I want you to get this. I want you to, I want you to get this. Having the desire is not the sin. I know that sounds off. Mm -hmm. Just because you desire a drink. It's talking about somebody who's an alcoholic. Trying to find something safe. But you never act on it. The desire is not necessarily the sin. I want you to get this. He says, verse 15, this is John 1 and 15. Then, so first of all, you're drawn away of your lust. You're drawing back from God. You're drawing back from God's word. You know what God's word says is true. Let's just do the safe one. Sex without outside of marriage. Let's just do the sex one. Just just do the safe one that we all can agree on, I think. Um, so we, you already know that you have this void that you end up in the bed with somebody you're not married with. But listen to what your shaping in iniquity was. You're, you were shaped in that iniquity based on a void from having a male, uh, someone, a father figure or a father or male affirmation. And so because of the lack of that in your forming years, it is shaping you in an iniquity that anytime someone speaks well of you, that is a male. And because you are craving, you have a lust for affirmation from men because you did not receive it. You now end up in a position of vulnerability because you have not dealt with that lust. Every man, when he is tempted, when he is drawn away of his own lust, that means every man will be tempted and every man has their own temptation. Man here is male or female. We all have something that it, we are weak in. We all have an area that requires us to depend on God. We all have an area that we have to put on the altar and we grow when we begin to overcome this area. So it says, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and then he's enticed. Then, after that, that's what then means, when lust, lust hath conceived, oh, lust, lust conceived something. So it's one thing for it just to be lust, but now there's conception. When lust conceives, then it bringeth forth sin. When it is finished, still talking about lust, it now brings forth death. I got to read this to you in another translation. So I'm going to read just the next one that says, do not err my beloved brethren. Let me give this to you in another translation because I really want you to get what it is saying. Um, I really want to get it, get, get, get it. Verse 12, James 1 and 12. Blessed, this is the amplified, so this is going to be a little more detailed. Blessed, which is meaning happily, happy, spiritually prosperous, favored by God, is the man who is steadfast under trial and perseveres when tempted. For when he has passed the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those he loves. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God for temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. For God cannot be tempted by what is evil and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed, and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire 
which is a lust or a passion. Then when the illicit desire, now the desire is illicit. When the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So lust gives birth to sin. When sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. Do not be misled, my beloved brothers and sisters. Hey, Karina. Hey, Elder. Elder Chris. I'm going to go back now and I'm going to read this in the NIV because I want you to understand what the Lord is saying. I begin to talk about not being distracted so that you won't hear from the Lord in this season. And the Bible says it over and over. He that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches, particularly in the book of Revelation. When John is pinning to the seven churches, he says that each time because the church, it needs to be emphasized. He that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. And so I'm going back to verse 13 and I'm reading in the NIV. This is what the word of the Lord says. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. We've already discussed the fact that temptations are evil and they are sent to draw you away from God. Testing is sent to prove you in God. It's much like when you're in school and you take a test and you, and you pass it and you go to the next level or you're promoted to the next level. God does not test us with evil. So, so God, the Bible says when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. This is the NIV, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And the sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Well, we know from the book of Romans that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Verse 16 says, don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Listen, y'all, we all will be tempted by evil of our own lust. Your lust is different from my lust. Because our lust were birthed uh, in the environments in which we were raised and formed. When the Bible says, when David says, I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, we all were born with a sinful nature. That's what it means. We were born. That's why we have to accept Jesus to change our nature. But our desire by, by, by nature, who we are, we are have a sinful nature. There is no good thing in man. Without God, there is no good thing in man. Our righteousness is as dirty rags and we need God. Listen, and I talked at the beginning about the pastor at our church who transitioned. She always had a saying that said it takes God to love God because without God on the inside of you, the human man, human flesh is incapable of loving God. It takes God to worship God because if I have not yet accepted Jesus and have God resident on the inside of me, I really don't know how to worship God. It takes God to honor God because in my sinfulness, born in sin, shaping in iniquity, I fall short in even honoring and respecting a holy God. But when I accept Jesus, I now accept him through Jesus. I now worship him through Jesus. I now praise him through Jesus. I now talk to him because of Jesus. I now rest in the finished work of Jesus. I now, greater works will I do, but I'm doing them through Jesus. I'm laying hands on the sick through Jesus. I'm, I'm telling the dead to be raised through Jesus. It takes God to love God, to serve God, to worship God. But in, mm, in this season, mm, y'all know me already. In this season, we are to avoid distractions at all costs. It is a season to be disciplined and to buffet your flesh. 
We do not preach against sin in the masses anymore. We only talk about things that make us feel good about us. But I want you to know the Bible, I'm sorry, is not about you. It's not about me. The Bible is about Jesus. If I don't preach Jesus, I have done a disservice because I have not given you the gospel of Jesus Christ when I only preach to you about you. This book was not written for you. It was written to unveil Jesus. It was written, the Old Testament concealed Jesus and the New Testament revealed Jesus and everything about the book shows us that we need Jesus and then it shows us how to follow Jesus and it shows us how to love like Jesus and it shows us how to live like Jesus and it shows us how to function as ministers of the gospel like Jesus. It shows us how to disciple people like Jesus. See, we say what would Jesus do, but we say that and we fail because we leave Jesus out of the equation. If I motivate you, it's not enough. If I inspire you, it is not enough. Transformation, change in your life does not occur without Jesus. It does not occur without Jesus and it does not occur without the word of God. You cannot positive think yourself into being better. You cannot think good thoughts and get better. No, the Bible says it this way. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are of a good report, whatever they're being any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. It is not enough to say I have positive thinking because the Bible did not tell me to think on positive things. He told me what to think on. That's why we're so filled with anxiety and we're so filled with anxiousness because our minds are set on things of this world. And if we continue to set our mind on the cares of this world, we will be tossed to and fro. Before I got to the verse that says, before I got to the verse that says that, that we can't be tempted, God does and tip with evil. The Bible says in the book of James, let me just read it to you. Verse seven, that a person, um, let me read, let me read back. No, 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 let me go back. Let's start with verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given unto you. If you do not operate in wisdom, it is simply because you have not asked God for it. God has promised to give it to everybody. We all could have the same amount of wisdom if we all had the wisdom of God. But we are trying to have the wisdom of men. We want to be smarter. We want to be more intelligent. We want to produce more. We want to do all of these outside of God. But he says, if anyone lacks wisdom, give it to me. The King James says, he unbraided it not meaning he will not hold it back. So if you lack wisdom in any area, all you have to do is ask God. Begin to make that part of your daily prayer. Every day that you pray, begin to ask God, and I hope that you pray every day. Every day that you pray, I want you to ask God for wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom on the marriage, wisdom on the business, wisdom in my ministry, wisdom, God, in every relationship, wisdom, God, wisdom. Don't let me cut off relationships that you meant for me to grow through and go through. But I cut it off because the world has told me, oh, it's toxic. The world has labeled it. But there are some people that God has sent to, for us to, 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 it's almost like an abrasiveness one with the other. But when you get on the other side, it is going to produce something for the Lord. And you will listen to all these self-help tips that are not biblical. And self cannot help self. I need somebody to type it in the comment. See, I don't believe in self-help. I believe in self-responsibility. But if self could help self, Jesus would not have had to die. If self could change my life, then Jesus did not need to come all the way down from heaven, put himself into human flesh and be born of a virgin and be born and live for 33 years and die on the cross and get up on the third day. If self could do it, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. The problem is you have been self-focused for so long <laughs> that you have not been God-focused. 
You have not prioritized him. They are teaching you to prioritize you without prioritizing him first. See, true balance. The Bible says, now I feel like I'm everywhere, but we're just going wherever we go. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1, that a false balance is an abomination unto God and a just weight is his delight. God does not want you even to be out of balance focused on you. Really part of having a family lets you know it's not all about you. The problem is we have a society where every Everybody thinks it's about them. No, it's not about you. It's about God. It's not about you. It's about his plan. It's about his will. It's about his purpose. It's about your family. And it's about what God wants to leave through the family in the earth. That's why the first thing God created was family. When God broke a covenant with Abraham, he begins to tell him, in you will all the seeds of this earth be blessed. It's all coming through the family. That's what the fight is about in your family. That's what the division is about in your family. That's what the strife is about in your family. It's a season to have a, a healthy conflict. This is the season to have healthy conflict. We're going to go back to the book of James in one season. But see, some of you have avoided people because you say, oh, we're going to argue. Well, maybe you need to argue. If no one is going to get hurt, if no one is going to get violent, and you already know that, then maybe you need to sit down and have a hard conversation. Maybe it's time that you decide that your family is worth fighting for. Listen, mm, thank you, Holy Ghost. See, sometimes we look out so much and we think... Think everybody else's family is better than our own and God has given you to be a steward in your own family and you will sit and you will help people fight for their family and you will sit back and let your family fall apart oh the devil is a liar hallelujah 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 Hallelujah. You might have to have a hard conversation. Thank you, Lord. And that's why he said, get wisdom. Because wisdom can turn a hard conversation and bring about resolution for the glory of God. See, the problem is perhaps because you're the one on this live, then God is requiring something of you. And let me tell you something I learned in marriage counseling a long time ago. In the beginning of our marriage, when things were tumultuous and everything was always on 10 and this one is, is, is threatening, I'm going to walk out. And this one is threatening, I'm going to walk out. When all of that foolishness was going on, the counselor said one thing. Somebody, if it's not going to be both, somebody's got to be more mature. I don't know if you heard that. Somebody's got to be more mature than the other. Somebody's got to say, I'm a sacrifice for the whole until we're both sacrificing. Somebody's got to put their pride down first. Somebody's got to say, I'm going to put my pride down to, for me as an individual to fight for us as a whole. So you think you're more spiritually mature than everybody else in your family. Well, praise the Lord. Then that means that somebody is you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You're more spiritual. You pray more. You have more scripture. All those things that you think make you more spiritual than that person is you. To whom much is given, much is required. Much is required. The one that is going to have to put their pride aside is going to be you. The one that's going to have to take, take one for the team is going to be you. Since you're the spiritual one, since you're the mature one, since you're the one, then it's going to be you. It's, it's you. It's you that's going to go and ask for forgiveness, even though you feel that they wronged you or you feel that your response was provoked by what they did. It's you. Mm hmm. I, it, 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 he was saying it about Jesus. 
Are you the one or should I look for another? I came to tell you there's not another. It's you. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. See, sometimes we all want peace. But we're not willing to do what it takes to make peace. So because we're in a day and age where we're not really willing to lay down our desires for the desire of the whole and do what it takes to make peace. We, we want peace. So we just retreat. So we say we'll have a peaceful environment. So I'm going to just keep everyone out of my environment. But yet you don't have peace. Because you have not had restoration. Peace is wholeness. Nothing missing. Peace is not me being in my house and you being in your house and we just don't deal with each other anymore. There is, there's no reconciliation in that. There's no restoration in that. If COVID... Y'all, I can just feel the presence of the Lord. If COVID-19 taught us anything... It taught us that we needed one another. Don't, don't get to the end of your life and you would have cut everybody off. Don't get to a season that you're going to need help and you have no one to help you because you're going to cut everybody off. I'm going to say this and people don't like this and I see a lot of comments and I understand that it has to be in balance. But I'm going to say it. The family unit was created by God to function in a particular way. In, in the mind of God and in the wholeness of God, you would have two good parents who were two whole parents who would raise their children to be whole and take care of their children. Their children would grow up. They would marry people and they would have whole marriages and they would have children. And now they're parents and they're children and they're grandchildren and they're raising their children. And by the time their children get to a certain age, the parents are starting to get older. But because the parents have loved them so well, they, they through reciprocity Prosody begin to take care of their parents. They don't feel like it's a burden because God set up a system. It's almost like an ecosystem. They took care of you first because at the end, you're going to come back and you're going to reciprocate that which they gave to you. But now because sin is in the earth and then you grow up and then you see perhaps that somebody had parents better than yours actually didn't mean yours was all bad. You just saw somebody that you thought was better than yours and because because yours wasn't like that one. Because yours didn't have a big enough house. Because yours didn't have two parents. It was only one. Because yours didn't have this. Because you're always comparing. And anytime you compare, you're going to fall short. Anytime you, I don't care if you feel like you're the superior one in the equation. Even anytime you feel the need to compare, you by default are falling short. Even if you think yours is better than theirs, you are falling short because you feel the need to compare. So now we have all these checklists. We have these checklists. Did they do this? Did I get to go to the school I wanted? Did I live in the neighborhood I wanted? Did I do this that I wanted to do? Because you know what? Oh Lord, I'm not going to, I ain't going to be, I ain't going to help my mama. My mama should have did this. My mama should have did that. I didn't get this. I didn't get that. It's the destruction of the family unit. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't even know why I'm saying all this first. <laughs> this is not what we started off talking about when, for those of you who just came on. But you teach your children how to take care of you by what they see you do. I don't know who this is for. So if you sit in your house on your phone in front of your kids and talk about your mama every day on the phone, if you sit in your house in front of your kids and talk about your ex-husband every day on the phone, if you sit in your house and talk about whomever in your family every day, I need you to hear this one scripture. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. That which a man soweth, Galatians 5 and 1, that shall he also reap. The family unit was created before the church. And part of, okay, I, I am going to go back to James to close that up in a moment, but I don't know why we're here because this is not what we even started off talking about. What I have watched and observed 
from people I have talked to, much of what we call church hurt is not fully church hurt. It's family hurt. I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people I know who are angry at the church. They are angry because their parents represented the church and because their parents fail them or they think their parents fail them or they think their parent loved the church more than they love them or they think their parent did whatever and they think their parent okay so their parent uh, fell short and got a got a divorce cheated on the wife whatever and that hurt then turns toward the church because they were the representatives of the church It's all a strategy for the enemy to pull you away by your own lust. I'm not lost. We started off in the book of James uh, verses chapter one, verse 13 through 15 saying every man when they are tempted, you are drawn away by your own lust and that God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither does he tempt man. And so you are drawn away by your own lust that you wish for Born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So whatever your proclivity was, whatever your bent was, whatever you were exposed to in your formidable years, you'll see some people stuck with, they, they, they struggle with rejection all of their life because it was introduced in their formidable years. They struggle with abandonment issues because they were abandoned in some form from their formidable years. And when you do not go back all the way to the root of a thing and pull it up at the root, this is why you can't play with the devil in this season. This is why you can't play patty cake with the devil. This is why you can't be a friend of the world in this season because you will never defeat a devil that you are friendly with. You will never have full victory with over a devil that you feel like is acceptable in some areas and in some areas he's not. You cannot because this is why I went back to the beginning of, of, of James chapter 1 to say if any of you lacks wisdom you should ask God who gives generously to all without fault finding and it will be given to you but when you ask you must believe and doubt not because the one who is double minded a double minded man is unstable in all his ways a double minded man so you have to believe and doubt not because believing and doubting is double minded. Oh, somebody need to get that. Believing and, and believing and doubting is being double minded. Oh, I'm going to go back. My computer's getting ready to die. So hopefully I can catch this in the King James before because I want you to hear it in the King James right quick. He says. Oh. I can't even touch those others. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally. God will give you wisdom liberally and upbraid it not and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For if he wavereth, it is like the wave of a sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. You cannot think you're going to receive anything, not just wisdom. You cannot think you're going to receive anything of the Lord if you believe and then doubt. And then it says a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Yes, brother Ernest, Lord help my unbelief. Hallelujah. I don't, I don't know how we got all, went all the places that we went. But I want to go back to that every man when he is tempted. Is drawn away by his own lust. This is the season and time to just be honest with God. Because the only way to overcome your own lust is not to be in denial about your own lust. That word lust there is your desires that are not in alignment with God. Your desires that are not in alignment with his word. Every man when he is tempted is drawn away by his own lust. 
which means the devil does not tempt you with anything he knows you don't want. Hey, Demery, the devil does not tempt you with anything that he knows you do not desire. He is not going to trap you with something you don't want. He knows the type of woman you like. He knows the type of man you like. He knows the type of whatever you like. And when he sees you at your most vulnerable time, he's going to present that option to you. Every man, when he is tempted, see, this is God allowing you to know that you're actually in control. Because the devil only comes to the areas where he knows you are weak. So, so this is the season and time to really get before the Lord about you. You done prayed about everybody else. Listen, about you. you done, okay, I'm getting ready to start talking real bad grammar. That's a disclaimer. You done prayed about your business. You done prayed for a marriage. You done prayed every, about everything that is not even important to God. Those things are consequential. The, 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 uh, the earth is the, is the Lord and the fullness of thereof. You being rich, you having money, all of that is easy. All of that is easy. Because if that comes, that God can give that to anybody. It rains on the just and the unjust. But for you to work out your soul salvation with fear and trembling, that's important to God. That's important that you are truly a reflection of him when people encounter you. That you are truly a reflection of him. How can you be a reflection of him? Be a reflection of his word. The Bible says in John 1 and 1, and y'all hear me say this all the time. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So don't tell me you worship God when you disobey his word. I'm going to say that again. Don't tell me you worship God with your whole heart and you disobey his word because he and his word are not separate. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. John 1 and 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among them. So now we understand and thank you for those of y'all that are giving badges. Thank you. Now you understand that the word is Jesus. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. I believe it's first John. Um, I pulled it up the last time. I thought it was five and seven. I wanted to make sure. First John five and seven says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. These three are one. So the Bible doesn't even say in first John five and seven, it doesn't even say the father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. It says the father, the word, and the Holy Ghost, because Jesus is the word. So do not say you worship God, yet you disobey his word. You disobey his word. You disobey his word. <laughs> AMG Millionaire says, I am single. Could you please pray for me? You know, this is going to sound funny, and I think tonight is just one of those nights. Uh, some nights I'm a little more open, uh, but the way the spirit shifted in here, I don't really think you need prayer for being single. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think you really need a prayer about being single. I think you need to just seek God. Just be obedient to God. Just, just follow God. Listen, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else is going to be added unto you. And that's paraphrasing. That includes a spouse. It's not hard to get married. 
I'm, I'm not going to get into this tonight because I'll go too far. Now I see Audra coming on. I can't get into this tonight because I don't want this to be an all-night live. But listen, y'all, I'm going to talk on relationships one day. I keep, I keep trying not to. But listen, I'm going to tell you something. It should not be as difficult as it has been for people to get together and get married, particularly in the body of Christ. If I'm a young lady who is saved and I'm a young man who is saved and I am living for the Lord, it should not be as difficult as it has become. Come, and I am not denying that it has not been become difficult. But anytime something becomes difficult that was never meant to be difficult, it allows me to know that the enemy has done this. Something that the enemy has done, he was strategic in his plan. He was strategic in how he laid it out. He caused so many things to happen that it caused almost uh, two sides, women on one side, men on another side, and it's almost like they can never find the one. The men are talking to my husband and they're having the same complaints about the women as when the women come talk to me and they have complaints about the men. And what I know for sure is an enemy has done this because it should not be this difficult. When God says it's not good for man to be alone. So because God says it's not good for man to be alone, the enemy is doing all he can to ensure that you are alone. It's God's way. I'm sorry. It's the enemy's way of fighting against God's plan. It's the enemy's way of fighting against that which God created before he created the church. The church was not even created until the book of Acts. So the, the family unit, the family, the husband and wife, Adam and Eve were created from the very beginning. It should not be as difficult as it has become. An enemy has done this. But what I do want to do is talk to you about your own lust. I do not want. Let me stop. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Somebody stop me. Jesus. Listen. I do not want you in your desire to be married so bad that you just make yourself vulnerable to person after person. I do not want, let me just, let me just wolf proof you for a moment. Let me just give you a word of wisdom. Let me just give you a word of wisdom. Turn off all the relationship gurus. Stop listening to all the relationship gurus who especially are not Christian. I don't care how many followers they have. I don't care how many people love them and love their advice. I'm going to also say Say this, women, if you can just look in the last few years, there have been several men that women have listened to for relationship advice and ended up that things weren't the way that you thought they were on the backside when their own business starts coming out. The Bible says for the older women to train the younger women. Stop taking your vulnerabilities before men when you are a woman. Stop sitting yourself in front of men who are capitalizing on the fact that you desire something so bad. You desire something so bad that you... Oh my God, I, I forgot this is not a closed session. <laughs> that you, you let somebody who is not even qualified who's not even saved, who's not even filled with the Holy Spirit, even if they're saved, who's not even walking after the Spirit, who's filled with pride and lust themselves, you sit and allow them to pour into you when words are seeds. And all of those seeds that they are depositing in you are taking up residence on the inside of you and it is growing something. I don't know what it's growing, but, but stop. Stop. There are. Just stop. I'm going to stop. That's all for a closed session. For those of that know me, you know, I can kind of go in and I just have to be careful. Because they're getting rich off you and you're still single. I'm, I'm going to just say it. They're getting rich off you and you're still single. They're getting rich off you and you still have daddy issues. They're getting rich off you and you still haven't gotten healed from what 
happened to you in childhood. They're getting rich off you and you still have a negative view of men. Listen, um, listen, I understand things happen to people. So I don't, I don't, I don't negate what happened. I don't minimize what happened to you in childhood. I don't minimize what happened to you when you were a teenager. I don't minimize any of that. But what I do suggest and this is the example that I get give you is that you choose wisely. So when I mentor young ladies, this is the example, the way I'm going to give it to you. And I have I have a man corners on here who could testify to this. When I minister, when I mentor young ladies one on one and I don't really do that anymore. So I'm not taking new one on one mentees. I'm still working on creating that mentorship program that everybody keeps asking me for. But the people that I already have been mentoring for years, um, several of them had challenges with um, their relationships with their mother. And I hope you get the example that I'm giving. Karina, you're engrafted in. You know that. Um, several of them had challenges just for whatever reason with their mother. Oftentimes, it's not even what happened between the two of them. It's generally started with what happened to the mother before she even had the child. But several of them had challenges with their mother. And as their mentor, it was important. And the Lord allowed me to speak into their lives in those areas. Vanessa's raising her hand. I wasn't calling any names. But one of the reasons I could speak into their lives in that area is because I did not have that same deficit. Too often, we connect and take advice from people with the same deficit, thinking they've been through what I've been through and they can help me, when actually, if I've not been through the hurt, I can see it through a different lens and pinpoint something that someone who's been through it possibly cannot see because sometimes... They're not even fully healed and you're connecting with people because they've been through what you've been through and you don't even realize they've not been fully healed. And all things that you are, all the things that you are doing is, is exchanging the spirits, the familiar spirits. And Vanessa says, I took her mother's side to every time I didn't take her mother's side. She didn't understand that. And I know it felt like I was taking your mother's side. I was taking the side of the relationship. And so sometimes it may have looked like I was taking her mother's side, but actually I was standing on behalf of the, the, the reconciliation of the relationship. So in order to do that, because I'm older than Vanessa, I could see things from her perspective, but also because I am older, I could also translate things uh, that from about her mother, not even knowing her mother, but by way of the Holy Spirit and the experiences God has given me, I could kind of connect the dots that made it easier. I'm not saying I'm the cause because Vanessa still had to do her own work for her to follow and get the reconciliation she desired because what I've learned is even when you're hurt by people and even when you don't want to deal with them because you're speaking out of hurt, the inner child, the inner little girl still desires their mother, even though the adult is saying, I don't need the relationship. I'm grown now. Da, 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 da. And I'm not saying that Vanessa was saying that, but she did fight. She did fight back. Vanessa, I'm thank you. Vanessa understands the process now, being a mother, married and a mother herself, but she did fight back. And so this is also why you have to deal with someone who hasn't had that same hurt because her being my mentee, if I already had mama issues, if she fought back, it could trigger me to me and my mother if I had a bad relationship with her. And now, even though I'm trying to help her, I see her fight back as something different and I move away from it. So it was important that I was helping her not from a place of being wounded in that area myself. And I hope that makes sense and that you can apply it to relationships. Perhaps you don't need to ask somebody, I mean, that has not had 
a long enough sustainable marriage? Certain questions. Because anybody can be married, have a good time for a short period of time. Anybody can do that. It requires a little more to have longevity. And so I'm not saying longevity is everything because, you know, I read all these comments uh, and I see people saying, oh, people, it's overrated. People say be married for 30 years, but then they were all unhappy. So that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying if you are asking and seeking from advice or looking to people for advice, there should be certain criteria that they have had um, that they should have before you listen to them. And I got all of that from somebody saying, pray for them to get married. Hallelujah. I think this is ending. Vanessa's giving her testimony. My relationship with my mom is amazing now, but being open to my perspective was the key to the healing process with her mother. Amen. You know, men, Vanessa and I might should do a live one day because, oh, Lord, that was the that was the mentee that tried my patience that matured me in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I love you, Vanessa. Thank you so much. Um, is it Vianca who says I'm so grateful for this live? I am. I think this is coming to a close for those of y'all are just getting on. We really didn't start off talking about relationships. That just happened because somebody asked for prayer. And I don't really think you need prayer to get married. I think you just need to date and go on a date. And if you don't like that person, you move on. And you, and I don't, I go on a date. Not go, not go sleep around with everybody. Go on a date. Let's be clear. Because that could be translated to something else. Um, thank y'all for the badges that are coming through. Um, but I just want to reiterate to you. That God does not tempt you with evil. God does not. <laughs> she said, she had, let's do it. We have stories to tell. Yes. Uh, God does not tempt you with evil. He can't be tempted of evil. Therefore, he won't tempt you of evil. And um, every man, when he is tempted, he is drawn away from his own lust. That is the book of James chapter one verses. I think I read 13 through 17 which is a little more than I just stated. This is not the season to be distracted. This is the season to have your heart postured to hear from God. God is speaking. Y'all, I started off talking about, and I plan to close with this, I believe. Uh, I started off honoring Pastor Bonet Moon, um, who transitioned last night, who was one of the pastors at our church. And I'm going to say this. Pastor Moon has fruit that will be in this earth forever. There are so many ministers and elders that went through the Potter's House School of Ministry that came through under her tutelage that have all been impacted one way or the other by her ministry. And even those outside of that, her, the God's Leading Ladies program, all of those things that she did at the church that she really put her, um, she really put her handprint on everything. Uh, Closing the Gap is this Saturday. It is at St. Anne Episcopal Church in um DeSoto, Texas. It is in my story. Um if you want to see it, the flyer with the address. Um but it is in my story or you can do DM me and I will send you the flyer afterwards. Um but I said that all to say we have been saying this now particularly through COVID, but some of this started in 2019 that our generals are transitioning. Thank you so much, Spider Stitch, uh, that our generals are transitioning. And um, and I want you to I want you to begin to do all you can in your sphere of influence and in what God has given you and the responsibilities that God has given you spiritually. I want you to begin to take ownership of your life, meaning I want you to begin to study the word of God for yourself. I want you to begin to talk to God on a daily and a consistent basis. If you are a person, yes, there is a virtual option. 
Uh, if you are a person that speaks in tongues, I want you to practice every day. I don't mean practice like go make something up. I want you to pray consistently until you can go into the spirit, in and out of the spirit at, 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 at his leading, at his prompting. Uh, as if it's your second language. It is the time to build yourself up in prayer, time to build yourself up in praying in the Holy Ghost and praying the word of God and also for reading the word of God. And so we're just in a critical time. This season of transition is not concluded yet. There will be other transitions. There will be others that we will mourn. There will be others that we, um, there will be others. Hallelujah. There will be others. But God has not left us, as Jesus said to the disciples, I don't leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you another comforter. And that comforter is the Holy Spirit that you and I have access to today because of Jesus Christ. So I am praying for you all. I hope you are praying for me. Uh, if you have not, please go to my YouTube channel and subscribe and, and you will be able to watch, uh, closing the gap Saturday on that channel. Um, it's on Facebook. It'll be on my Facebook, but it'll be easier to catch me on YouTube. And that link is in my bio or it's simply Christy Dobbins. If you would like to keep up with the updates that this ministry, when I, um, prep places that I'm preaching and different things like that. There is the link, uh, the first link in my bio says connect with Ella Dobbins through text. If you click that link, all you have to do is put the initials CDM, Christy Dobbins Ministry, CDM, and hit send, and it will sign you up to receive text message alerts. We have prayer on Wednesday mornings at 6 o'clock a.m., and I will put that number in my bio. I don't have it there. I thought I did, but I will add it to my bio. But it also, a reminder will be sent out uh, on the text message so that you will know. I know a week or so ago uh, when we were at Women That Are Loose, I changed the date from Wednesday to Thursday. And those who received those text message alerts received it and were on on the next day. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight and putting up with these glasses. If you got on at the end, I, I can't find my glasses. I think I left them at Nordstrom Rack earlier today. And um, and my other ones, I bit. So listen, I had to go find some old glasses I had in a drawer somewhere. But I pray that you all have a good evening, a good night. Keep us in your prayers. We are always praying for you. Love you all much. Thank you to all of you all who gave badges tonight. Uh, thank you, Karina. I love you much. Love you much. And I hope to see you soon. Uh, God bless you all. Y'all have a good night. God bless you. Thank you. Last name, Daniels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darian. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. <laughs>